Good morning and welcome to worship at Altador Baptist Church. This what beautiful Sunday, a bit cool but nice, on Aug Sunday, August the 30th. Happens to be uh, our 40th anniversary. Happy anniversary to my wonderful husband. Our call to worship today. We have come to worship God who loved us before we were yet born, who knows us even better than we know ourselves, whose presence never leaves us, and whose love for us never ceases. This is our God, our Creator and our Redeemer. Let us worship Him together, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture today is found in uh, the first one is found in Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 8, and uh, we'll read that now. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he puts the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the garden, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then to verse 15. The Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Our second scripture is found in the book of Psalms, which is the middle of your Bible and is made up of a number of different songs. And Psalm 139, we're going to read again a few of the selected verses there. Psalm 139, starting at verse 1. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful to me, too lofty for me to attain. And then over to verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me as we pray together this morning. Let's pray. Creator God, our Father, Jesus Christ, Son of God, our Redeemer and our Savior, Holy Spirit, our Comforter, who is with us always, we thank you. Thank you for the privilege of being able to worship you freely and openly. Thank you for the miracle of technology that we sometimes don't appreciate, but we do appreciate it during these times when it is difficult to get together in person. We thank you for your presence with us and the miracle of that presence that you are with every one of us, wherever we happen to be today. May we feel your presence. We may, may we feel your arms wrapped around us, holding us close. May you place a hedge of protection over each one of us and surround us with your love and your grace. Thank you for the many, many blessings that you have showered upon us this week and throughout our lives. We don't always recognize them as we should, but we are grateful. We thank you, O oh God, for wisdom, 
for knowledge, for discernment, for all the things that you give to us. We thank you for the beauty of your creation. We thank you for family and friends, for those that support us through tough times like we're going through now. We pray for our families and for our friends and pray that you will be close to them and help them to feel your love and compassion. Bless each one of them, we pray. And help them to walk in a closer relationship with you every day. We acknowledge, O oh God, that we have sinned against you and we are grateful that you forgive us our sins. And then you welcome us back into your presence, your holy presence. And that because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, you view us as holy. Thank you for the work that you are doing in us, molding us and shaping us and helping us to become a little more like you. There are many thoughts on our minds today. We think of those in our midst that are grieving. We think of those around the world that are grieving. And we know that you're, you, Holy Spirit, are our consolation and our comfort. And so we just pray that you will be very near to all of those who are grieving the loss of family and of friends. We think of those in Lebanon who are grieving the loss of homes and jobs and an entire infrastructure. We pray that you will be with them. We thank you that you do go before us even when times are difficult and that we can trust you and walk with you. And we pray, O oh God, that you would heal this world. And we pray that as we heal and as creation heals, we will learn the things that you want us to learn so that when we come out the other side of this pandemic, we may realize the good that we have and leave the bad behind. We think of all of those who are um, facing the start of school this week, for some in person, and we pray that you will protect teachers and students and all the staff, keep them healthy and keep them safe. We pray for those who are learning online or those who are learning it's at home, in homeschooling. It's a different world this year than it was last year, and we're all beginning to navigate it as best we can. Give us wisdom, give us patience, and help us to learn, particularly help us to learn to be more like you. We pray for all of our families. We pray for our church family and the many people connected to this church. May you help us to continue to grow deeply in you. Help us to care for each other and to be your hands and your feet to the neighborhoods around us. Thank you for the privilege of being able to lay all of our burdens on you knowing that you care for us. It is such a privilege to be able to be your children and part of the family of God around the world and here in our neighborhood. In your name we pray. Amen. Our third scripture this morning is found in Romans, which is in the New Testament, we're going to Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 22. And this time I'm reading from the message version of the Bible. All around us, we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs. But it's not only around us. 
It's within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We're also feeling the birth pangs. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. That is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us, but the longer we wait, the larger we become and the more joyful our expectancy. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs and our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail of, in our lives of love for God is worked out into something good. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. After God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. And after he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously complete, completing what he had begun. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> well, we have gradually been working through the first chapters of Genesis, which form the foundation for the whole rest of Scripture and for the whole rest of history. It is the crucial basis for our faith. We really need to understand this part of Scripture. It's the very beginning. We moved last week from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2. And in the middle of this second chapter, there is one basic command that God gives. The Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. This is a, an important command, and I would like us to take a little bit look, of a look at it. And as we do, I'd suggest that we come at this with an open mind, willing to think this through in what may be a different way. Maybe this command isn't a negative thing. Most of us tend to think of commands as negative. Maybe there's a lot of good here. Maybe God gives us commandments out of love and really wants what's best for us. Actually, there's no maybe about any of this. All of those are true. This is not a negative thing, this command. There is a lot of good here and God does give us commandments out of love and he always does want what is best for us. The scriptures we just read remind us of this. He knows us inside and out. He created us. He prays for us and with us. And he really does want what is best for us and knows what is best for us. And we just have to trust that. Those scriptures that we read are full of reminders of those, exactly those things. Sometimes we think of the commandments as the Ten Commandments of Exodus. And only those. And we often talk about the Ten Commandments. But there are actually many, many commandments throughout Scripture. The first, the original Ten Commandments, are creative. And they are found in Genesis 1. And we've read them a number of times this summer. But did we recognize them as commandments? Let's think about it for a minute. In Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, Let there be light. Verse 6, let there be an expanse. Verse 9, let there be waters gathered and dry land. Verse 11, let there be let the earth sprout vegetation. Verse 14, let there be lights in the heaven. Verse 20, let the waters teem with living creatures, let the birds fly. Verse 22, be fruitful and multiply. Verse 24, let the earth begin fo bring forth living creatures after their kind. Verse 26, 
Let us create human beings in our image. Verse 28, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and rule. Ten Commandments. The first Ten Commandments. Dr. Johnson, in his book, The Story of All Stories, which is the basis for our sermon series, says, This helps us then appreciate the commandments God spoke to Moses. It turns out that God speaks those Ten Commandments, in Exodus 20, to make it possible for us to live in the fullness and freedom of the Ten Commandments of creation. Now that's an inter interesting twist, isn't it? Looking at the Mosaic commandments really changes in the light of the creation commandments. And it's an interesting exercise I'd encourage you to do this week. The commandment we find in Genesis 2 is all about God and our relationship with him. It's the only command that God gives in the garden. God doesn't give us these commands because of a hunger for power or control. God is already all-powerful, so it's not that. He has created us and loves us and really wants what's best for us. He gives us the freedom of choice, and then we choose whether or not to give him control. I love the way that Dr. Johnson paraphrases the verses in Genesis 2 that we just read. He says, Adam... You are what you are because of me, your creator. You are a glorious creature, magnificent beyond what you yourself know. I made you to be dependent on me for life. All I ask of you is that you be you, a creature, a human being. You are free, but do not use your freedom to try to be other than you are, a dependent creature. Do not try to be your own God. For all your magnificence, you cannot be your own God. You be you, and I will be me. Do not try to be what I am. I tell you this for your own sake. If you try to be me, if you try to be an independent being, you will ruin your world. You will die. Isn't that a wonderful description? This is the reason behind God's command here. It's about relationship with God and with ourselves and about who we are created to be. It's about trusting God and knowing that when we walk with him, in communion with him, we are at our best. This relational command is about recognizing that we have all we need. We don't need to know it all. We need to know the God who knows it all. In the passage we also read in Genesis, we note that there were actually two trees in the garden. We keep focusing on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because that's the tree that's connected to God's command and the tree that is connected to the sin and the fall of man. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the tree that has affected the life of every human on earth. But this other tree is a very important tree too, and we can't overlook it. This tree is all about life. There's a reason that both of these trees were in the center of the garden, which represents the world. The tree of life in the center is about God being the center of our lives and the center of everything, life. God is truly the center of the universe and we need to acknowledge that daily, hourly, every moment. Life is not about us. It's about God. And this is what the tree of life really symbolizes. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German, German Lutheran pastor and a great theologian, explained this very well when he wrote the, follow, the following in his book, Creation and Fall. He says, It was in the middle. That is all that is said about it. The life that come forth from God is in the middle. That means that God, who gives life, is in the middle, in the middle of the world which is at Adam's disposal and over which he has been given dominion, is not Adam himself, but the tree of divine life. Adam's life comes from the middle, which is not Adam himself, but God. It constantly revolves around this middle without ever making the attempt to make this middle of existence its own possession. It is a characteristic of man that his life is constant circling around its middle and that it never takes possession of it. 
And this life from the middle, which only God possesses, is undisturbed as long as man does not allow himself to be flung out of his groove. Adam is not tempted to touch the tree of life, to, the, to lay violent hands on the tree in the middle, and there is no need at all to forbid this, and he wouldn't understand the prohibition. He has life. And so do we have life. When we believe and trust in the triune God, we have life, like Adam. Our life comes from the middle, not the middle of ourselves, but God. Our life, our abundant life comes from the constant circling around the middle, which is God. When we fail to acknowledge that and live into that, life really does fall apart. We are much better off with God at the center of everything. We do everything we do and everything we are. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is the second tree in the garden, is one tree, a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And every time we refer to it, we need to use its full name. God did not make a tree of knowledge. Some people have been led astray in thinking this. They tend to say that God didn't want Adam and eat Eve to eat from this tree because he didn't want humanity to know things, to think, or to use our brains. And that's absolutely not true. God delights in our discovering truth, in our learning about this wonderful world that he has created. He enjoys our emerging understanding of who he is and our developing relationship with him. He wants us to use our brains and to think. He spoke to us throughout scripture, particularly the epistles, which are the letters in the New Testament, encouraging us to use our minds to discern truths, to discern good and evil, and to learn. God did also not make a tree of evil. Nothing he created was evil. That's not who God is. Scripture tells us that when he made creation, he saw that it was good. And we, in our sin and evil nature, are the ones who create evil, not God. If he had created two trees, one good and one evil, then we would have to choose between the two. And that's simply not true. God is a good God and a holy God, and there is no evil in him. When we live with him at the center of our lives, he helps us learn to turn from evil. Dr. Johnson points out that there are a few things that we need to note about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. One, prohibiting us from eating the tree from the tree of knowledge of good and evil is not unreasonable or unfair. God has already given us everything we need for abundant life. And this tree was not something that we needed or need. Secondly, God made us. He has every right to make the rules or the commands, if that's how you want to look at it. I actually think it's rather scary when people have the attitude of, no one's going to tell me what to do. Really? I think that the one who created us has the right to tell us what he thinks we should do. And on top of that, top of that, if we all did exactly as we wanted, total anarchy would prevail in this world and total evil would be in its wake. Because you see, we are essentially sinful in nature and we need our good and holy triune God to rule in our lives and our world, his creation, in order to keep order and beauty. This attitude of one that is this one that is rearing its ugly head far too often these days. Nope, no one's going to force me to wear a mask, even if it's the best thing for all. I don't want to. Nope, I don't have to obey the health guidelines and protocols. I'm my own person and I don't care if I cause everyone around me to get sick. I still have the right to do what I want. Nope, I don't care if what I think is discriminatory or prejudiced. If you don't like it, tough. And I don't care who gets hurt in the process. I do have my rights, you know. We've all heard those kind of things, haven't we? And there is a fine balance between acknowledging the rights of people and individuals, and they are important, especially um, in these days. And that includes ourselves. And being an important part of God's family and the citizens, citizen of the world is the other side of that. The fine balance 
acknowledging the rights of people and individuals and being part of God's family and the citizens of the world who care for all of God's creation. All of this is why it's important to know and understand the God of truth who is at the center of our lives and to live as he would have us live. Thirdly, this command was for our own good. God doesn't want us to die. He wants us to live and live life abundantly and live eternally with him. Note that he doesn't say, if you eat from this tree, I will punish you or I will make you die or I will kill you. Rather, he recognized that if Adam and Eve were to eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then the eventual consequence is that they would die. And guess what? They did. And we also need to know that this holds true for all of God's commands. God really does want what is best for us, for our own good, to prevent us from ruining our lives. When we obey his commands, keep him in the middle of our lives and trust him, life really does go better. When we live into the salvation that God provides us through Jesus' death and resurrection, we shall never die. Fourthly, this command reveals God's respect for us. And I bet most of us have never really thought of that this way. Respect? Yes. God is treating human beings as the free, rational creatures he made us to be. He is showing us that we are not re robots and we do have free will and choice. And he's giving us the freedom to think and decide for ourselves. He wants us to come to him because we love him and to choose to walk in relationship with us. That, my friends, is all kinds of respect. God's re God respects you. He respected Adam and Eve, and he respects each one of us. Fifthly, this command involves a huge risk. God had just created a beautiful, beautiful world, literally paradise. And then he chooses to give a command to the first human beings on earth and let them choose how they will respond. He knows it will either go very well or very bad. And we now know that how that goes, don't we? So all of this is to say that I believe that God gave Adam and Eve this command out of love. He really did want them and he does want us to live in an intimate relationship with him. He doesn't want anybody to live apart from him. He doesn't want us to try to live independently of him because he knows what happens when we try that. And he is trying to warn us while still giving us choice. Adam and Eve didn't believe him and they did try to make it on their own. They quickly discovered that that didn't work. And some of us, even though scripture makes it all very clear to us, try to do exactly the same thing. And it doesn't work any better today than it did back then. In fact, our scriptures are full of examples of how this doesn't work. We must live with the triune God at the center of our lives. And we must live as the people of God that we are created to be. So to close, I want you to insert your name at the beginning of this as I read Dr. Johnson's paraphrase again. Beloved, put your name in there. You are what you are because of me, your creator. You are a glorious creature, magnificent beyond what you yourself know. I have made you to be dependent on me for life. All I ask of you is that you be you, a creature, a human being. You are free. But do not use your freedom to try to be other than you are, a dependent creature. Do not try to be your own God. For all your magnificence, you cannot be your own God. You be you, and I, God, will be me. Do not try to be what I am. 
I tell you this for your own sake. If you try to be me, if you try to be an ind independent being, you will you ruin your world and you will die. Let's pray. God, our creator, help. Help us to be us. Help me to be me. Help us to walk in an intimate relationship with you, dependent upon you. Help us to set, let you be the center of our lives and to acknowledge that day by day. We know that we cannot be our own God. Rather, we must let you be God and us be us. And to do that, we need your help. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now our benediction. Creator God, may your spirit open our eyes anew to the vastness and splendor of your beauty around us. May we hear and smell and see and touch the glory evident in all of your creation. And above all, let us see your beauty even in the brokenness of our brothers and sisters, all of them, created in your image and waiting to experience that redemption that comes only through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we go now to love and serve you, knowing that you, our triune God, go with us and before us. And to you be glory, honour forever and ever. Amen.